Well, last week, Chris set forward for us the problem of leadership. He brought us into the reality that we admire, we respect, we even revere good leaders. And at the same time, we resist, we critique, we sometimes even undermine leaders. I wonder, do you see this tug of war inside yourself? Do you see this tendency to both revere and resist leaders and leadership? Uh, Chris went even deeper into the reality that, that for many of us, we've experienced Bad leadership. We had a bad coach, a bad parent, a bad pastor, a bad teacher who really negatively influenced us. And so for many of us, we don't just come in sort of tug of war inside ourselves about leadership. We come in with with a, a cynical view of leaders because of experiences that we've had in the past. And so as we talk about any kind of leadership, we just acknowledge that's the reality, that's the starting point for us. But Chris reminded us last week that the problem isn't leadership. The problem is bad leadership, right? Like if the referee made a bad call in the game, the answer isn't we get rid of referees, right? Or if you had a bad teacher, the answer isn't let's do away with education. Or if you had a bad father in your life, the answer isn't let's do away with the institution of fatherhood. Rather, the solution to bad leadership is good leadership. And what God wants to show us this morning in the book of Titus is what good leadership looks like in the local church. And so for those of you who are Christians, this text reveals the kind of leaders you should look for, pray for, and even aspire to be. And likewise, if you're here and you're a skeptic, this is an important text because it shows you what good leadership in the church looks like. And the reason that's important is because for many of you, the reason you're skeptical is because you've experienced some kind of bad church leadership, either up close or or at least from a distance. You've looked at church leaders and churches and said, yeah, I'm not so sure about that. And so if you're a skeptic, can I encourage you that what we have here in Scripture is what good Christian leadership ought to look like. So that instead of rejecting Jesus and his gospel out of some particular experience in your life, you can instead separate bad leadership from good leadership, bad Christians from good Christians, and perversions of the gospel from the true good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So here's what I want to do this morning. Here's sort of the outline by which we're going to go forward. We're going to talk about why we need leaders, what kind of leaders we need, and how we get them. All right, why we need leaders, what kind of leaders we need, and how we get those leaders. So if you have a Bible, it will be in the book of Titus chapter 1, which you've already heard read. Let's look first of all at why we need leaders. Titus chapter 1, verse 5. Paul writing to his protege, his disciple Titus, he says, This is why I left you in Crete so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. I don't know where you shop for groceries. I generally shop at Baker's. Baker's is kind of an ordinary person grocery store. It's not the cheapest place, right? If I wanted to go more frugal, I could probably go Aldi. If I wanted to go like in a foodie direction, I could probably go Whole Foods. If I wanted to go ultra hipster, I could join like a CSA farming organic cooperative, right? But I'm just kind of an ordinary guy. Baker's is in my neighborhood. It's walking distance from my house. You know, I like the localness of the place. Our relationship with Baker's recently has gotten a little bit rocky because my wife is on the outs with Sean the Deli guy. And it's made things honestly a little challenging. So Sean the Deli guy was in a bad mood one day and he was rude to my wife and my wife does stuff about things like that, so she found the store manager and said, hey, Sean, the deli guy was kind of rude to me, I just wanted you to know, you know, for training. <laughs> Ever since then, Sean, the deli guy has it out for my wife. So like when she walks in the store, he stares daggers at her, man. It's like really hard to get ham and cheese, you know, because Sean's just not an enjoyable person to be around. It's like he has a personal vendetta for us. I'm a little concerned he's going to start like shaving fingernails into my cheddar cheese. I, I don't know where this is going to end up. So, things are tenuous with Baker's right now. But, in addition to the problems with, you know, Sean the Deli guy, Baker's rearranged the layout of the whole store a couple months ago. 
which threw my entire, entire world into chaos because what it did was it created disorder in my life, right? Like I had an orderly way of going to the store. I, I like to go conquer what I need and get out of there. I don't want to hang out in Baker's all day, right? And so I, I knew if I need sour cream, that's in the back corner of the store, whereas my favorite microbrew is up front toward the checkouts. And, and so I knew kind of where everything was. And now I go to get my favorite granola, and I'm in the toilet paper aisle, Right? And I go to where the pizza sauce used to be, and there's bottled water there now. And I'm all, I'm all confused on where in the world did they move all this stuff to. Now, I realize eventually they're all going to settle down. I'm going to figure out the new layout, and it'll be fine. Right? It's not the end of the world. But, but right now, it feels disorderly. It feels chaotic. Well, that's exactly what a church feels like when it doesn't have good leaders. It feels chaotic. It feels disordered. It feels unpredictable. And that kind of disorder hinders our growth in Christ-likeness. Because see, our souls are already chaotic and disordered enough because of sin. Because of the reality that we're broken and we live in a fallen world. And so we need the church to be a place of peace. A A place of order. A place of, if I can say it this way, non-boring predictability, right? Where our souls can find a cadence and a rhythm and a pattern and a liturgy that helps us grow up into grace. Paul says, this is why I left you in Crete, Titus, so that you could put things into order. How? By appointing elders in every town. See, we need leaders because they bring order. Not organizationally or administratively, but spiritually and culturally. They create a healthy context, a healthy culture where our souls can thrive. If you would have come to Quorumdale 10 years ago, when we first started this church, it would have felt a little disorderly. Some of you guys were around then, and you don't have to say amen, but you know what I'm talking about, right? I was the only elder at that time, and we had an outside board of advisors that were sort of helping us get this thing started, but it was a startup, man, and so there was a little bit of disorder, I'm not going to kid you. Like, there was a Sunday that when we went to communion, instead of bread and wine, We had glazed donuts and chocolate milk. Why? Because I put the wrong guy in charge of communion, that's why. And he was trying to be like innovative and different, and so he's like, you know, instead of bread and wine, let's just have, let's have a donut, and let's have chocolate milk. And so can you imagine, you know, going to the line of communion, sort of a solemn moment at the end of the service, and a dude handing you a glazed donut and some chocolate milk. I mean, people are just kind of like, what do I do with this? That, you know, it was a little disorderly, I'm not going to kid you. And so in God's grace, over time, he's raised up elders from within our church. And what those elders do is they help create a sense of rhythm, a sense of order, a sense of spiritual leadership. And we're thankful for that. So why do we need leaders? We need leaders because leaders bring order. Paul says to Titus, put what remain into order. Here's how I want you to do that. Appoint leaders. Appoint elders in every church. Now, what kind of leaders do we need? So, so we see why we need leaders is because our souls need order, our hearts need order and structure. But what kind of leaders do we need? Beginning of verse 6, if anyone is above reproach, and look again down in verse 7, an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. So we see twice reiterated in this passage that the kind of leaders God intends and desires and prescribes for His church are leaders who are above reproach. That doesn't mean that leaders have to be perfect, because no one is. But it does mean they need to be godly. Here's how John Stott says it. This does not mean flawless or faultless, or we would all be disqualified. Rather, candidates for the pastorate must be people of 
unquestioned integrity. They're mature in the faith. They're sound in character. They're godly examples to others. Now, we see then in this passage three sort of subcategories of what it means to be above reproach. So if we're saying, okay, we're looking for leaders who are above reproach, who are good examples, who are good models, who are Christ-like, what, what categories should we look in? And this passage gives us sort of three categories of what it means to be above reproach. First of all, these leaders need to be above reproach in the home. So look again at verse 6. It says, if anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. All right, so first of all, if anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, or literally the phrase in Greek is a one woman man. All right, so this certainly means you're not married to more than one person. Let's start there. But it also means uh, this kind of leader is a one woman man. So men, here's what that means. You're a one woman man. That's what it means. It means no pornography, no fantasy, no lust. It means you're cultivating oneness with your spouse. Or if you're a single man, by the way, this doesn't mean the only person who can be elders in the church or married men. You can be single in this scenario. It's just saying majority of men are married, so let's talk about that case. But if you're a single man, this is saying you're a one woman man, meaning you're not cultivating patterns and habits of lust. And look, this is completely countercultural in the world that we live in, right? Because the world we live in tells you, men, just cultivate whatever lusts you want to. But God says, no, no, I want a different kind of men leading my church. I want a different kind of leader in my church. So a one woman man, and beyond just being faithful, this means if you're married, you have a strong marriage. Your wife respects and honors your leadership. There's a sense of care and concern and love and friendship that's present between you. Oftentimes when we do elder interviews here at Cormdale, I'll just look at a wife and I'll say, hey, if every man in our church was like your husband, how would you feel about that? And you can always tell, man, whether she lights up, she's like, man, that would be, that'd be good news for our church. Or sometimes she looks down and goes, well, I'm not so sure that would be good. So there, there's a focus on relationship with his wife and his sexual life. And then it says, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. Okay, now, there's a lot here. Is this saying, make sure your kids are Christians? Well, kind of. Yeah, that's what it's saying, right? Knowing that you can't cause your kids to be born again. The Holy Spirit has to do that. And so this is not taking that out of God's hands and putting it into your hands and saying, Dad, make sure your kids grow up as Christians. But it is saying, Dad, you're expected to raise your kids as Christians. You're expected that they would be obedient and under authority, that you'd be raising them in the ways of God. This is what we practice at every baby dedication we do. We ask a, a mom and dad to come forward and say, hey, do you commit to raise this kid in the instruction of the Lord? That's, that's what you're saying is, yeah, I want to raise this child to know Christ, to follow Christ. I want to create every opportunity in this child's heart and life that they would know Jesus, be aware of sin, see who God is, trust in Christ. So these are children who are not Wild, rebellious, disobedient, unsubmissive. Now, primarily this has in mind younger children, right, who are still under the authority and care of their parents. And so dads, let's embrace the reality that your kids are going to follow your example. Like the, the primary person they're going to look to sort of as a, as a template or as a compass for life is going to be dad. And so it's, it matters what your kids are like. It matters that you're leading in your home. What, what this is acknowledging is the church, one of the metaphors the Bible uses for the church is the family of God, right? This is God's family. And so the parallel passage to this in 1 Timothy says, hey, look, 
If you want to lead God's family, if you want to be a good shepherd, a good leader, a good influencer in God's family, here's where we start. How are you doing in your family? How are you doing in your family? So, men, I think we just sort of, before we even go further in this text, we need to sort of have a come to Jesus moment, right? Because what a lot of us want to do is we hear this stuff, and these are, this is a high calling on one, in one sense. And what we often want to do is we want to blame our lack of leadership on our circumstances, right? Like, well, man, I know, but you don't know my wife. You don't know my kids. Hey, you don't know the situation I'm coming out of and, and what I'm trying to overcome. You don't know where I've been and how challenging things have been for me. Hey, that may all be true. That's fine. Right? Each of us has a different hand that we're dealt in terms of the heritage we, we've come up with and the family God's given us or the family God hasn't given us, the opportunities He's put before us. But here's the reality, man. You're responsible for you. Right? Like it, you can't just avoid and go, well, I mean, I, I know this is, this is what the Bible says, but I can't really, I mean, it's hard for me and I can't really do that and it's, it seems like a lot of work and I'm not sure. It's just, no, no, no. Look, let's stop doing that. Let's just say, hey, we're responsible for us. God expects us to become the kind of spiritual leaders who are good examples, good lovers, good husbands, fathers, leaders. And if we're doing that well, that's the first work. And then God often gives us more responsibility and more opportunity. So man, I just, I just want you to just embrace this. Embrace this as God's invitation to be honest about who you are, where you are, where you're doing well, where you're not doing so well. And setting maybe a new trajectory, inviting maybe some community into that. Asking for feedback, help, encouragement, support. So the first place that these leaders are to be above reproach is in the home. And then secondly, we see they're to be above reproach in character. So verse 7, for an overseer. Okay, by the way, little textual note here. You'll notice in verse 5, it says appoint elders. In verse 7, it says an overseer, as God's steward, must be above reproach. And then not in this text, but over in 1 Peter and other places where these same leaders are talked about, it calls them pastors or shepherds. Okay, so what we're talking about here is the office in the church of elder, pastor, shepherd, overseer, or bishop. These are all the same group of people. Right? So you don't have elders and then pastors. They're not two categories of leaders. This is one and the same. The people God calls to the office of elder, pastor, leader in the church. For an overseer, verse 7, is God's steward. That's where Chris camped out last week. Must be above reproach. Okay? Now, notice these contrasts. He must not be these five things. Arrogant, quick-tempered, a drunkard, violent, greedy. If you think about those five things, they're really just different ways of saying selfish. Right? These are all sins of self. Pride, anger, and the desire for drink, dominance, and wealth. I right, so think about the average guy in the world we live in. Proud, angry, what I want is drink, dominance, and wealth. That's kind of everyone, right? Kind of the average guy. And what God is saying is, no, no, no. But you can't be that guy if you want to lead in the church. What I'm after is something completely different. I'm after a countercultural community that shows the world the beauty of who God is, and those things don't. That's not who God is. Furthermore, like Chris mentioned last week, that's against, that's contrary to servanthood and stewardship. Right? A leader who's in it for themselves, who's about pride, anger, dominance, drink, money, they're not there to serve. Okay, so, so this, this leader, this elder must not be these five things. His character can't be marked by these five traits. But rather, hospitable, a lover of good, a lover of virtue, self-controlled, 
upright, holy, and disciplined. So not these five things that are selfish and self-focused, but these six things. Hospitable. Loves what is good. Self-controlled. Upright. Holy. Disciplined. I mean, let's be honest. Isn't that just describing the kind of leader you'd feel good following anyway? Right, like if you're looking for a guardian for your kids, if you're looking for a, a mentor in your life, you're not going, man, who's the angry, drunk, belligerent, greedy guy? I'm going to give my kids to that. Would you, would you, can I write you into my will, bro? Right? You're looking for, man, hospitable, someone who loves what's good. They have self-control. They're disciplined. They get up early, work hard, lead their family. That's, that's, a, that's the person I'm looking for. These are all manifestations of death to self, right? These signify someone who has put self to death, has decided to follow Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is increasingly creating in them good fruit, good character, virtuous, godly qualities. A life of true virtue. That's what it means to be above reproach in character. It just means, it doesn't mean you're perfect. It means these things in general describe you. It doesn't mean you never get angry. It means you're not an angry person. doesn't mean you never struggle with greed or aren't tempted in that way. It means that's not who you are. You're defined by generosity, hospitality, goodness, holiness, discipline. I mean, that's just, the, that's just describing the kind of person you want to follow and really the kind of person you want to be. Like it's just, that's just describing a, a virtuous person. So, above reproach in the home, above reproach in character, and finally, above reproach in doctrine. Verse 9. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine, and also to rebuke those who contradict it. In other words, we're not talking here about leaders who kind of read their Bibles who know a little bit about the gospel. But rather, we're, we're talking about leaders who are grounded. Who are anchored in the truth. It has taken hold of them. They are passionate about the gospel, about God's word, about Christ, about the renewing grace of the Holy Spirit. And they're able, out of their own grasp of those things, or really to say it better, out of being grasped by those things, they're passionate about helping others understand, holding up and exalting and valuing what is true, coming against in a, in a gracious and sometimes firm way what is false, above reproach in doctrine. Okay, so we've seen why we need leaders. We've seen the kind of leaders that we need. Here's the final point. How do we get these kind of leaders? Where do these kind of leaders come from? The answer is actually right here in verse 9. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught, so that he may be able to give, sound in, or give instruction in sound doctrine, and also to rebuke those who contradict it. This is not just another qualification. This is describing how we get these kind of leaders in the first place. We get them through healthy gospel Discipleship. That's how we get these kind of leaders. See, here, here's how I think we tend to read this text. We tend to read this as, man, this bar is high. Um, be good moral people. And then, man, hold on to this doctrine so nobody screws it up. Right? Like, this is the kind of leaders we need. Be a good moral person and then, man, fight for the truth so nobody messes it up and gets it sideways. But I want you to notice again, in, in verse 9 it says, he must hold firm to the trustworthy or reliable word as taught. This word hold firm literally means cling to, grab onto, love. It's not talking about hold firm like, no, no, you can't take this from me, man. This is mine. False teacher, get away. 
right? This is talking about like, man, I love this truth. I love this word. This word is my life. This word has changed me. I hold on to it. I'm going to guard it zealously because I love it and because it has changed me. What would cause a leader to love the trustworthy, reliable word of the gospel? Just the fact that he's, he's seen its power to change. He's seen it change his own life. Right? Think about the context of this passage. Let's just broaden out and just grab the context of this so you can see the clarity of what I'm saying. Where are these elders going to come from? Back in verse 5, Paul, Paul to Titus. Titus, here's why I left you over there on Crete. Here's what I want you to do. Put in order what remains by appointing elders where? In every town. In other words, these elders that he's going to appoint are Cretans. They're from the island of Crete. What do we know about Cretans? We'll just look down on the page. Verse 12. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. That is hilarious to me. I don't know about you guys. I'm like, hey, here's what we know about you guys. You're evil, you're liars, and you're lazy. That's true. Man, that guy was right on. And so, so this is what we know, is these elders, these men who are going to be appointed as elders in the church are these kinds of people. They've come out of a culture that's marked by evil, laziness, selfishness, sloth. That's who they were. That's where they've come from. Well, what change? why are they now qualified to serve as elders in the church? Well, I mean, because they've been changed by the gospel, man. Right? Like, like Jesus came and changed those guys into these other guys. He, he came and renovated their character so that who they used to be is no longer who they are. Like, let's, let's just go over to Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, verses 3 through 8. This is sort of the, the core text in all of Titus. And I want, I want to show you, I want to just show you this is how the gospel works, right? Where are these guys going to come from? They're going to come from Crete. Where are the elders in Coram Dale going to come from? They're going to come from Omaha. They're going to come from the guy down the street who's going to get saved, meet Jesus, get transformed, or the guy here this morning who's still growing up in Christ, God's working in his life. That, that's where they're going to come from. Titus chapter 3, verse 3. For we ourselves, Paul writing autobiographical, writing about Titus, about all these people in all these churches in Crete, we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, hated by others and hating one another. That's who we were. But, when the goodness and loving kindness of God our Savior appeared, he saved us. Not because of works done by us in righteousness. In other words, not because we earned it, not because we deserved it, not because we were great people, but according to His own mercy. By the washing of regeneration and the renewal of the Holy Spirit, whom He poured out on us richly, through Jesus Christ our Savior. Okay, so connect, connect the Gospel. The Gospel is not just Jesus died for your sins so He's forgiven you. The Gospel is also Jesus pours out His Holy Spirit on you so you can change and become different. Let's not embrace half a Gospel, right? Let's not just say, yeah, Jesus forgave my sin. Let's also say Jesus sends the Holy Spirit so I can become a different kind of person. So that being justified by His grace, verse 7, we might become heirs according to the hope of eternal life. The saying is trustworthy. And I want you to insist on these things so that those who have believed in God may be careful to devote themselves to good works. These things are excellent and profitable for people. What causes us to devote ourselves to good works? What causes us to start laying down new patterns of obedience in our lives? 
What causes us to do away with the kinds of habits and patterns that used to mark us and cultivate new disciplines? Well, quite simply, what God's done for us in Christ. The fact that while we were foolish, disobedient, led astray, and slaved to our passions, He saved us. He reconciled us to Himself in Jesus. He sent His Holy Spirit, poured out on us richly, so that now we have power, capacity, desire to change and become a different kind of people. So how are we going to get these kind of leaders? Well, God, God's going to make them through the gospel. They're, they're going to come from right here, from among us. Just like for Titus, they were going to come from among the churches at Crete that Paul and Titus had planted, where he was discipling people in the gospel and trusting the grace of God to change them and transform them and raise up new and different kinds of people who were no longer marked by these old habits and patterns and qualities, but are now marked by a completely different kind of character and virtue. So where are we going to get leaders for Corndale? Well, I mean kind of from right here. From right here. We're not going to get these kind of leaders by putting out a resume on churchstaffing.com. Hey, we need some elders for Corndale. Man, if you're hospitable, if you're a lover of good, if you're upright, holy, and disciplined, go ahead and apply. We need to hire in some guys. Rather, it's going to come from us right here. The gospel renewing and changing people in this church such that we look around and go, yeah, yeah, yep, got all kinds of these men by the grace of God. Listen, my, here's my vision. And by the way, if it feels like I'm talking particularly to men, I kind of am this morning. Because elder is an office in the church that is particularly Men are supposed to fill it. It says right here, right? Husband of one wife. I realize in our culture that's getting a little strange, right? But this is classic, godly differentiation between the sexes, all right? So we need all kinds of leaders, men and women, in all kinds of facets of the church, but specifically in the office of elder, which is the office of pastor, the office of teacher. That one's reserved for men. Here's why. Because in the Bible, God is always masculine and the church is always feminine. And so those who represent Christ to the church by teaching his word have to be men. Why? Because Christ is a man. That's the only reason. Not because men are better than women, not because men are better at this than women. In fact, if women could be elders, we might have more of them. Not going to kid you. So that's a challenge to you guys. But, but because of this passage and because of just us wanting to honor the scripture's teaching here, I am pressing directly and specifically on the men. And here's what I'm also encouraging you women. I want you to love and value this. Here's why. Because when the men in the church are godly men, everybody flourishes. Everybody flourishes. Right? The women are well protected and taken care of and they flourish and thrive. The kids thrive. Everybody thrives. And listen, statistically and sociologically, here's what I can prove to you. When mom follows Jesus... That's good for the kids about 20% of the time. When dad follows Jesus, about 80% of the time the kids follow Jesus. It's just, it's something about how God's wired the world and, and how kids grow up. And it doesn't mean, hey, if you're a, a single mom or if you're married to a non-Christian, it doesn't mean, hey, just, you know, you're, you're, the, the odds are stacked against you. It actually means trust God's grace to do more than you imagine him doing, Right? But it does mean, guys, there's a specific responsibility on us. And we, 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 will not, we are not going to be the church where there are no dudes. Like we're, just, we're not going to be that church. We're going to be the church where the men are men and the women are women. And everyone's growing up in Christ. And everyone's leading in all the ways that God's gifted them to. That's who we want to be by the grace of God. So here's my vision for Gormdale. My vision is that there's men in this room right now who right now are enslaved to pornography, lust, selfishness, greed, pride, that those guys, five or ten years from now, are going to be elders. Why? Because Jesus is going to work on you and change you. You're going to put sin to death. You're going to repent. You're going to grow up in Christ. You're going to cultivate new habits and dispositions, and the Holy Spirit's going to graciously change you. That's my vision. My vision is there are men in here that aren't even Christians this morning that will be leading churches in ten years. Why? Because there's one of them right down here in the front row. That's, that story's already played out here. We're just saying, God, do that again. That's what Justin prayed. Hey, do that again. Do more of that. Well, our vision is not, let's go hire some leaders from outside so we can plant some churches. Our vision is, God, man, raise us up an army 
of godly men and women who look like this, who lead with integrity, who live lives above reproach, who are great models and examples of what it means to follow Christ, and who, in a culture marked by selfishness, display a whole different quality. Right? A whole different character of life. So when people are tired of the selfish, greedy, prideful, arrogant, drunk leader, and go, man, where can we find some leaders that aren't like that? And when they look at the church, they go, oh, man, here's some leaders who are hospitable. They seem to love what's good. They seem to be disciplined. They work hard. They're lovers of God and one another. That's intriguing. Hmm. It's part of my vision and desire that when the world looks for leadership, it ought to come to the church. Unfortunately, it doesn't right now. You know why? Because we're not doing a very good job living this out. And so what God's inviting us into this morning is something different. And so I want to ask that you'd join me in prayer and that we just join our hearts. I want to ask you to do some specific things. First of all, as you bow your head, I want you to just take stock of your own life. And if God's putting His finger on some things, would you be honest with Him about that? And secondly, would you pray? Would you pray for the, the people sitting around you this morning? You pray for the people yet to come at the 11 o'clock service. Would you ask God to graciously raise up these kinds of leaders over and over again in our church? Women, would you pray for the men of this church that they would be men of virtue and character? Would you examine if there's anything in your own heart that just chafes against the idea of, of men really being good men? If there is, would you begin to just identify that? And then men, would you take stock of your own heart? And would you this morning commit yourself to pursuing this kind of life. I know we're all at different places. I don't, I don't know where you are in the journey. You may not even be a Christian. But as you sense the Holy Spirit working on you, on you would you just say, yeah, that's, that's the kind of person I want to be. And would you invite the Holy Spirit right now to begin doing the work deep down inside you that He needs to do to help you put sin to death and cultivate righteousness through the gospel. Father, thanks that while we ourselves were foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions and pleasures, passing our days in malice and envy, while that marked us, God, your kindness and your goodness and your grace saved us. I pray you'd write that story in someone's life even this morning. That, that you'd be saving people even this morning, calling them out of that by the grace of Jesus Christ to come to the end of themselves, and bow down before you, turn from their sin and embrace Jesus. Thanks not only that you've forgiven us, but you've sent the Holy Spirit to change us. And so Father, we, we want to grow up into these kinds of people. Thanks for giving us good elders. I'm thankful for the men that I serve with in this church. I'm thankful for many other men that are on this track and that are growing in these ways and that display this kind of character. Father, would you, by the grace of the gospel, through the power of the Holy Spirit, increasingly make these things true of us. And Father, where we chafe against this, where we make excuses about this, where we want to push this off on something else, would you rebuke us and call us to ownership? Father, for my, for my sisters in the room that feel sort of a feminist spirit rising up and saying, well, why not? How, how come? God, would you just soften that so that we can 
instead of taking sides, we can just embrace the beauty of what it means for men to be men and women to be women. Jesus, thanks that you're reshaping and reforming us in Christ through the gospel. And so thanks that, <laughs> that you're asking Titus to raise up people from Crete and install them as elders. We pray the story that you'd write here in Omaha and beyond would be that you'd raise up men who once were marked by these things and make them elders, make them leaders. Father, you'd take non-Christians and make them Christians and you'd take immature and ungodly people and make them mature and godly. Would you help us to be a people who are blameless, who are above reproach, who display a good life because we've met a good Savior who's died for our sin and who's given us a good gift called the Holy Spirit who helps us put sin to death and cultivate virtue. Thanks for your love for us. Thanks that you do all this for us in spite of who we are. And so God, we just ask your grace to overwhelm us this morning and your spirit to be alive and at work changing us for our good and for your glory. Amen.